بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب يسر ولا تعسر وتمن بالخير بك نستعين يا فتاح رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي قال الله تعالى يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله يتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير صدق الله العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى He's addressing all of humanity in verse number 13 of Surah Hujrat He says that we have indeed created you from a female and from a male from a male and a female and we made you into tribes and clans so that you get to know each other. The most noble in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that individual who has the most taqwa. Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing and all aware. I'm going to talk about taqwa at the end. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it in the Arabic for right now. We'll get, we'll get to the, the actual definition of it. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that we've been created from a male and a female, that's referring to Adam and Hawa alayhi wa salam. Adam alayhi wa salam and then Hawa alayhi wa salam. Now this specific verse we hear it often quoted in regards to racism, in regards to tribalism. This specific verse was revealed in regards to a man by the name of Abu Hind. And the Prophet wasallam told the tribe of Banu Bayada, it was a tribe, he told them that he wanted them to marry Abu Hind to a woman from amongst their tribe. And Aba Hind was one of the freed slaves. So the Prophet ﷺ told that tribe that I want you to marry this man, a very righteous person, I can vouch for him. I want you to marry him to some woman from your tribe. Look how they responded. فَقَالُوا لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. So they said to the Prophet ﷺ, that Nuzawiju Banatana Mawalina that we marry off our daughters to freed slaves. We we marry off our daughters to freed slaves. Asking question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded right away. Yes, we made you into specific clans and specific tribes. But that's not the only thing that you look at when marriage time comes. The main number number one on, on that criteria is inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum. You look at the most noble and who is the most noble? The one that has the most taqwa and this man has taqwa. That's why I told you about him. So they are just thinking in terms of oh is he Qurashi or is he not? Is he from this tribe? Is he from that tribe? Kind of like how we do back home in, in India, Pakistan as well. Oh, he's from that street, or he's Pakistani, or he's Bangladeshi, or he's he's Hyderabadi. He's yeah? uh, Arabs had the same thing. Yeah? Arabs have the same thing, same concept. Now, since we're on this topic. No, I, I, I told you that we were going to talk about it. We'll, we'll see how much we can talk about it, inshallah, today. Um, there's a hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, which the Prophet sallallahu tells us the criteria we need to look at when we're choosing a spouse. Okay, or when helping our children choose a spouse. What are they? The Prophet sallallahu said, تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعِينَ that a woman is married for four. You look at these four criteria. Limaliha. Okay, you look at her her financial status. Lihasabiha. You look at her lineage, her family. No. Number three, Jamaliha, her beauty. And number four, and most important of all, 
What is it? Her deen. Okay, her deen. Fadfar bi that deen. This isn't from me. This is the Prophet ﷺ said, Fadfar bi that deen. That I want you to pay close attention to the deen aspect of it. So he repeated it twice. Fadfar bi that deen. Taribat yadak. Otherwise, if you don't pay attention to that, you're going to be losers. And wallahi, I can tell you multiple examples of individuals that I know personally who either married because of lineage or either married just because of beauty or either married because of family and did not pay any care to deen and their marriage didn't last long. Now, it doesn't mean that if you, you know, it's going to be perfect when you, yes, they're going to be, you know, if they're a righteous individual, then there's better chances that your marriage works out. But you look at all aspects that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith. Not just jaman, right? not just the aspect of hasab, not just the aspect of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, mal. You look at her wealth, okay? you look at her financial status, you look at her lineage, you look at her beauty, yes? And you look at also her deen. And that's the most important of them. And you know, marriage. Well, don't get me wrong. It's it's not easy. Right? It's not easy when when you're you know you're having your daughter getting married to so and so individual. You're having your son go get married to so and so individual. Obviously, it's a stressful time. It's stressful. It's it's joyous at the same time. It's difficult. It's not easy. But at the same time we sometimes don't help ourselves out either. When we add things to marriages that don't necessarily have to be there. Well, we add certain aspects onto marriages that have no place in marriages. I still remember when I was, you know, uh, you know leading to Rawih at, at another state and I met a brother and, you know, he told me, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, we had, we had our nikah, we had our walima done. And, you know, people gave gifts, they gave gifts. And, alhamdulillah, he wasn't very wealthy. Right? He wasn't very wealthy at all. He said, from the gifts, we were able to, you know, me and my wife were able to go on a, a small honeymoon. We didn't have any debt after our marriage. Uh, we didn't take out any loans for the marriage. It was nice, it was simple. And, it wasn't stressful on the, the bride and the groom. A lot of times bride and groom think, oh man, we have these individuals coming from this country, these individuals are coming from this country. I have to make sure I make reservations there, make reservations there, make sure the lights have to be like this big and they, you know, the hall has to be this big. And then we know time and time again, I know personally time and time again, individuals that taken out loans for their marriage. Are you, you know, I thought that was absolutely insane when I first heard that. Maybe that's normal, but when I heard that the first time, when people are taking out loans for, for marriages, I mean, and these are individuals, they're not well off. They, if they're taking a loan, they're obviously not well off. So they, they, have, they have their car payment, they have their house payment, they're already in debt, you know, from, from, from medical school or whatever. So when you see things like this, obviously then people get stressed out over marriage. Because it is difficult then. Because we're expecting, you know, like, like the, you know, the, the king and queen of, of, of England is getting married every, after every single wedding that you see in the Muslim community. That's why it's so difficult. That's why it's so stressful. We don't need that every single time. You don't need that at all. Why am I saying every single You don't need that at all. No, every individual, every family has their own financial status. And inshallah, khair, fine. You have your own financial means that you... Yeah, you look into when you, when you're when you're getting your sons or your daughters married. But you know things like taking out loans. Another very strange thing. I'm not sure where where we get this from. I if I I could you know if I had to guess it would probably be from the Hindu culture, where we where we mandate upon the the you know the the, the bride side that they give you know furniture or they have to give something. When they're getting married, okay. Obviously, the groom is, you know, paying mahar. That's from the deen. That's from the religion. Why right? he has to pay mahar? He has to pay a dowry, okay, to his potential spouse. But where in the world are we mandating upon the 
the girl side, the bride side, that she has to pay or her family has to pay for something. Where is that coming from? It's not from the deen. I, I, if you found it in the sunnah, let me know because I've never seen it. I've never seen it. And I've seen families from day one get into argument and day one get into fights over their in-laws just because of that. Oh, they didn't give us this furniture. Oh, they didn't give us that furniture. Or they gave it to us one week late. I have seen with my own eyes and I've personally experienced with these individuals that they, they from day one, they're, they're fighting. What type of barakah are you going to have like that? Where? Where is the barakah going to come? We want, we want to do what's best for those two. We want to do what's best for the bride and the groom, do we not? When we, when we have the marriages take place, we're not looking, we're not selfish. We're not looking, I want the hall to be like this for me. Yeah? No, I want, I want to you know, have this, all of these thousands of you know, foods to be there. And this is going to look good on my family. What about these two individuals? Isn't it their marriage? Aren't we supposed to care for their marriage? How was their marriage supposed to be? When we're fighting from day one, how was the marriage supposed to be? Look. And I mean, it, it's, it's simple, but it's, you know, uh, marriage is, is simple, but it's, it, it, there is some stress there. Don't get me wrong. There is going to be some stress, but we, can't, we shouldn't make it extra stressful by adding these, you know, what I would call them bid'ah. They're, they're it's complete innovations. They're not part of the deen. You know, we have the nikah, we have the walima, all these other things. We have like five other functions. I have no idea where they came from. Please, you know, excuse my ignorance if, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm offending anybody. But this, this is where individuals, they, they get very stressed out over this third function, the fourth function, the fifth function, sixth function. It makes it so difficult. So difficult. And that's why, you know, you have, uh, you know, our children nowadays, you know, Getting, getting married later and later and later. Why? Because getting married is so hard now. It's so difficult for them. They're like, I don't, I can't do it. It's, I can't, you know, I can't get married right now. My parents are telling me no. It's, it's a responsibility. Yes, they have to be mature. That's fine. They have to, you want to make sure that they have an ability to, to support their family. Yes, these are obvious that they want to be able to do that. But this is where the parents come in and show them their, show them their experience. Okay, this is what you need to have in your marriage to succeed. These are the things that we'll, we'll be doing. These are the functions that we'll be having. We'll be following the sunnah. Okay. And when we see these, when we, when we do things according to the sunnah, then you'll see barakah come from different places that you can't even imagine. And you know, I, one other hadith that I wanted to mention about this, and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the next topic of taqwa. There are many hadith that are, you know, that have, that are, are a proof from amongst the uh, Sahaba and the narrations of, uh, of, of the Prophet wasallam that talks about compatibility in marriage as well. Compatibility, obviously has to be compatibleness between, compatibility between husband and wife. That has to be there. And there's a hadith narrated by Ali radiallahu anhu that the Prophet wasallam said, Ya Ali, ثَلَاثٌ لَا تُؤَخِّرْهَا الصَّلَاةُ إِذَا أَتَتْ وَالْجِنَازَةُ إِذَا حَضَرَتْ وَالْأَيِّمُ إِذَا وَجَدْتَ لَهَا كُفُوءً Prophet ﷺ said that three things should not be delayed. Number one is when salah time comes, you pray. No, salah time comes, you pray. Okay, obviously regarding in regards to the preferred times that you pray those salah in those preferred times. Number two. Janaza is ready, you know, you've done the, the whole shrouding, you, you wash the body, it's ready. Don't delay it, pray the Salat al-Janaza immediately. You want to do again, not what's best for us, what's best for the Mayyit. What's best for the Mayyit, you pray the Janaza right away. Not, oh here, you know, we're going to keep his body for one week and then let his relatives come. No, you're putting the individual into more pain. You, if he's, you know, uh, a Sa'id, if he's a righteous person, he wants to go to the Qabr right away so he can have his ex Qabr expanded and filled with nur and enjoy that. He doesn't want to stay in this dunya. And if he's Shaqi, if he's a wretched, then you don't want him to be near him anyways. Okay, either way, he w you want him to be buried as soon as possible. Okay. So that's number two. Number three is, وَالْأَيِّمُ إِذَا وَجَدْتَ لَهَا كُفُوًا That you marry off your daughter, when you find a compatible match for her. You find a compatible individual for her, you marry her off. You don't say, oh, I don't, 
He's he's. I wanted him to be five nine. He's he's five seven. Oh, he's engineer. No, no. I wanted I wanted a doctor. Um. Oh, he's you know he has black hair. I wanted you know brown blonde hair. I'm 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 exaggerating, but compatibility. We have compatibleness. You find compatibleness. You know between uh, you know the the future uh, you know husband and spouse, husband and uh, and and wife. And you get them married. You get them married. Now going back to the uh, ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that inna akramakum inda Allah yatqaqum. You know on the day of Fath Makkah, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is beautiful. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he destroyed all of these. Uh, you know, tradition, these tribalism, these, 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 you know, characteristics that they had part of their tribes. Islam completely obliterated that. And how did he do that? Look at, look at this. On Fath Makkah, the Prophet ﷺ told Bilal radiallahu anh, to go on the Kaaba. Go on the Kaaba, and he said to give the adhan. So he gave. This was a slave, right? This was a slave that they used to beat and torture and and lay down in in over 100 degree weather, put boulders on him. Uh, this was that individual who's being the mu'addin of the Muslims, the mu'addin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He told him, go on the Kaaba and give the adhan. Individual, Attab bin Usaid bin Abi Al-A'id, he said, Alhamdulillah illadhi qabada abi hatta la yara hadha al-yawm. The non-Muslim, he said that, you know, it's, it's, it's good that my father passed away before seeing this. Okay, the non-Muslim said this. That is good, my father passed away because you else he would have had a heart attack. If he saw this happening, you know, a slave going on the Kaaba, this is our Kaaba. He's going on top of the Kaaba and giving the Adhan. You know, we're glad he didn't see that. You know, other individuals said, Ma wajad Muhammadan ghayra hadha al ghurab al aswad mu'addinan. That Muhammad didn't find any other, anybody else. Look at the words that they used against Bilal radiallahu. Muhammad didn't find anybody else to call the Adhan besides this black crow. This is what they said. See, this is the racism that existed, and we see this racism still today. We still we still see that racism. We know in akramakum We know that Allah subhanahu wa taala said that the most noble is not the individual who is white, not individual who is black, not individual who is brown, not individual who is orange. No, the individual that is most noble is the one that has the most taqwa. And what is taqwa? What is taqwa? Whenever I need to personally look for a definition of a word, I go to the, you know, my favorite book to go to is Imam Raghib al-Asfahani's, I always tell my students this as well, Imam Raghib al-Asfahani's uh, Mufradat. Very one volume, one volume work, beautiful work though. He gives a definition, he gives ayats related to it, he gives a hadith related to that definition. So he mentions the definition of taqwa. He says, he says, Hifdhu nafsi amma yu'thim is protecting the nafs from that which is sinful, that's number one. بِتَرْكِ الْمَحْذُورِ by, by leaving, وَذَلِكَ بِتَرْكِ الْمَحْذُورِ And that is by leaving those things that are prohibited. By leaving those things that are prohibited. وَيَتِمُّ ذَلِكَ بِتَرْكِ تِلْكَ الْمُبَاحَاتِ And also that, that taqwa becomes complete by leaving those things that are, you know, permissible. Okay? Permissible. You know, they're in that gray area. Well, Allah Alam, what, what are they? لِمَا رَوَى الْحَلَالُ بَيِّنُ الْحَرَامُ بَيِّنُ فَحَقِيقٌ أَنْ يَقَعَ فِيهِ That halal is clear, haram is clear. And it's those gray areas that sometimes people, oh, I'll just do it. By doing that, remember, we do it once, we do it twice, then we're going to eventually fall into the haram. So taqwa is to stay away, steer away from those ambiguous, those, those uh, you know, gray area matters. Because that's showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we don't, we don't care if we have option one, we know for certain is, is good. Option two, we're not, we're not so sure of. We're going to choose option one day and night. We're showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we show that we, we, we always put deen number one in, in, in our plate every single time. And, and inshallah, our take home point is that we make deen number one, that deen then decide, you know, the number one deciding factor in every single aspect of our life, especially in marriage. Especially in marriage. Subhanallah, Rabbika Rabbil Aizati, Amma Yisifun, Wassalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.